Um, thank you for being here for another event where this is our first time we've actually screened a film in this space. So uh, I think it's fitting that the film is Adams County, USA. And our guest who's going to set things up is Jake Borit. Uh, he is an accomplished documentary filmmaker, the son of renowned historian and Lincoln scholar Gabor Borat. Jake's films, which have aired on public television in all 50 states, include The Gettysburg Story, Boy Scouts of Harlem, Budapest to Gettysburg, and the documentary we're screening today, which was Jake's very first project, Adams County, USA. Uh, I actually watched Adams County, USA in eighth grade, in my eighth grade civics class. So uh, that's how old you are, Jake, now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jake uh, lives on his family's historic farm along Marsh Creek. He'll probably tell you a little more about that. And uh, most recently, Jake produced all of our media, almost all of our media, six short films, I believe, throughout our museum downstairs. And I'm sure some of you have been in there and enjoyed them already. They're all fantastic, narrated by Stephen Lang, produced by Jake. Uh, and, and the footage that Jake has captured of Gettysburg is probably the best video footage ever recorded, uh, mostly through drones and time lapse and things that you can't do anymore uh, on the battlefield. But we're just thrilled to have Jake here with us today. Without further ado, Jake Borit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Um, apologize for my voice. It was my college reunion in Baltimore this weekend. And so I, I, I had a lot of, you know, very short same conversation over and over about kids and family and life and work. So it was really wonderful, and I'm not 22 anymore, I've learned. Um, anyways, but I'll do my best to be heard. Uh, so what an honor to be here on this weekend with this opening, and, and, and sort of what a special, a special film for me. I mean, this is literally the film right out of college that I made. I came back, and uh, it was the bicentennial of the county, and um, started working on this, and we were. I really, it was really almost like grad school in a way, learning how to make a film. Uh, and again, it was a bicentennial of the county, and, and we wanted to do a film that was broader than the Civil War and Lincoln history of Gettysburg, which is obviously very well known. And there's many documentaries and films and other things done about it. And it was it was a really exciting project for me to having grown up here and to sort of explore this history. And this is when the Historical Society was on the seminary in the old, old dorm or the cupola building. And uh, Dr. Gladfelter, um, Woody Christ, if any of you remember, Elwood Christ, uh, and some of the old lions of the Historical Society, um, Arthur Weiner, and then a young Tim Smith, who was sort of just starting out as, I mean, he wasn't just starting out, but he was almost the apprentice to Dr. G and, and Woody, uh, who's now, of course, our, our county historian. Uh, and he, he needs robes and a scroll and everything, we decided. Um, and so it was, it was a really educational but really fun project to explore the history of the county and discover all these stories. I knew when it was going to be a fun film when I was reading the transcriptions of German court testimony from the 1750s about the murder of Dudley Diggs, <laughs> which is pretty obscure research. And it was captivating, this is what was going on in very, I mean, pre-United pre States, obviously, in the 1750s. Uh, and then getting into the stories of Mary Jemison and Thaddeus Stevens, of course, all the Civil War and even the food industry and, and so a lot of it. And what I realized, it was what bound it all together was the story of a singular place of, of Adams County, of this land, and, uh, and how the land had evolved over time. And really what it was was a story of preservation and evolution of, of us living here. And it was a really fun project because obviously we have the battlefield and, and state forest, but there was a real active just beginning effort to preserve land here. And one of the people that was central to that was Tom Clowney. And Tom's in the audience tonight, or today, this afternoon, this morning, whatever it is, now. Uh, and uh, he was really supportive and very thankful to have Tom in the audience. And so you'll see him here. He hasn't aged a bit since that, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, and it's, I think come in kind of full circle to have done this film. Andrew saw it in junior high school, I guess, and opened his eyes to the possibilities of the stories in the county. And then he's taken it and run, to put it mildly, with, you know, leading the effort and the campaign to create this, this new venue. And when he, I was working with the campaign and helping, but when he asked me to, you know, would you consider doing the films? And it was very much like revisiting this project from 20 plus years before. 
Uh, and so you'll see this if you've been through the museum or we'll go through the museum, you're going to see a lot of references, even like pieces of the script. They're almost verbatim to what we use in the museum before in this kind of timeless story of this place. Uh, and so I think it'll be fun to see. And frankly, the budget and the, and the technology available and just my abilities and know-how was a lot different, <laughs> a lot less back then, hopefully. Um, and, uh, so you'll see it's, it's, you know, made in basically from 1998 until 2001, we worked on this. Uh, and I know Deb McCausland's in the building. She's in the museum right now, but maybe she'll be up later. But she, she produced this with me and she's a local historian that's really been a leader on expanding the stories in Gettysburg about some of the black history that was essentially forgotten that I had never heard about. That's now a central piece of the histories in this museum and elsewhere. So there's a lot of good people mostly working as volunteers on this. Uh, like a lot of the historical society. So I can keep talking. I can take questions afterwards if you have any, but enjoy the film. This is Adams County, USA. Appreciate it. A warrior fails to the enemy and is turned to stone. A German settler fights to the death for his land. A young Irish girl sees her family scalped, yet finds the strength to endure. Out of the ruins of revolution, a man raises a town and a community is born. A politician fights tirelessly for education and freedom. Runaway slaves resort to any means necessary to escape. A local boy goes off to war and returns to fight in his homeland. A woman cares for hundreds of dying soldiers before falling in love with one. A leader speaks for two minutes and changes the course of a nation. A farmer's absurd venture bears fruit and ignites an industry. A soldier returns a hero and finds a home. Now, a new millennium shapes the future. From the most unimaginable horrors to the sweetest of fruits, this is the story of a land and a people like no other. This is their story. This is our story. Nuwat, Loat, Nuchink, Nialo Gomik. All things begin and end with Creator. In that way, we remember who we are, where we come from, and where our stories come from, and the importance of our history all the way back to creation. An old legend comes down to us from the time when Indians lived on the land we now call Adams County. 
It tells of a young brave ordered to the top of a rocky mountain to watch for the approach of a war party. He falls asleep and fails to see the enemy. His people are massacred. An old medicine man survives and turns the young Indian to stone. The stone sentinel is still atop that mountain looking for the enemy, ever watching the land. In 1682, an English Quaker named William Penn sailed up the Delaware River to begin a colony. Penn dealt fairly with natives, purchasing ground before allowing Europeans to settle it. Soon settlers flocked to the colony called Pennsylvania. In the beginning, when the Europeans came here, they were approached in peace by the Indian people. They were approached with a, a handout, a hand of peace to live together, to share their land together. And that peace always wound up being taken advantage of. The white man was like a great monster. And what that monster ate was land. The land that would become Adams County was almost entirely covered in trees. Here, Indians hunted and fished, sheltered, traded, and made war. As Europeans moved deeper into this wilderness, they cleared the land and built farms. With them also came a land dispute. Both Pennsylvania and Maryland claimed a strip of land about 70 miles wide. That 70 mile strip included a sizable part of what is now Adams County. Among the settlers eager for Pennsylvania's abundant land and religious freedom was a German named Martin Kitzmiller. Kitzmiller is an immigrant. He's escaping the old world, looking for a new world, looking for America. He's looking for what in a later day people called the American dream. In the 1730s, Kitzmiller bought land deeded by Pennsylvania and built a mill along the Little Conewago Creek. The property abutted a massive parcel granted by Maryland to an Englishman of noble blood named John Diggs. John Diggs was obviously land hungry. He was thoughtless. He was essentially uncaring. Diggs believed he owned Kitzmiller's land. Soon, the two were at odds. I proved by unquestionable evidences my possession of the very spot where Martin Kitz Miller lives, John Diggs. Diggs daily threatens us unless we pay him. We are under daily terror lest we should be carried off to Maryland. Martin Kitz Miller. I think it was easy to look upon this land as next to life itself our most prized possession. We have thrown sweat into that land. We have perhaps thrown blood into that land. And someday we want to turn it over to our children. And so we're going to fight for it. John Diggs raised a band of men that included his son Dudley. They seized Martin Kitzmiller at his mill, claiming he was under arrest. I called for help. My son Jacob Kitzmiller, having a rifle gun, come out. Two of the men seized Jacobs to take the gun from him. My wife come out. The men tore her hair and beat her. In this confusion, the gun in Jacob's hands shot deadly digs in the belly. The digs boy died within hours. The Kitzmillers were tried for murder in Pennsylvania. They were found not guilty. The fact that Kitzmiller wins shows that this is a new world. It shows that a poor man, a miller, 
can get justice against a well-to-do nobleman. This is America. His son in the ground, John Diggs, left his land and returned to Maryland. The Kitzmiller family continued to operate their mill on the Little Conewago for the next 100 years. To end the colony's dispute, two Englishmen surveyed the boundary. In time, their efforts grew to have a significance far greater than a simple surveyor's line. When you say Mason-Dixon line, it goes beyond this boundary uh, that we, the Maryland, Pennsylvania boundary. It goes, it, it just means slave states on the one hand, free states on the other. A century later, a young nation would erupt over this divide reaching its climax in a battle fought less than 10 miles from where Jacob Kitzmiller killed Dudley Diggs. The land dispute did not prevent others from venturing into the wilderness. Scotch-Irish began settling near Marsh Creek. Among them were Thomas and Jane Jemison and their children, including baby Mary, who had been born during the Atlantic crossing to America. It was later said that the life of Mary Jamison would be as stormy as the ocean upon which she was born. In the isolation of the South Mountains, the Jamisons cleared the land and built a farm. Mary grew to be a strong girl of 15 years. Vigor and strength characterized our little paradise. Nothing to alarm, save the midnight howl of the wolf or the shriek of the panther. Mary Jameson. In 1755, North America erupted in the war for control of the New World. In western Pennsylvania, French and Indian forces defeated an English army. The English retreated back to Philadelphia, leaving the entire frontier open to attacks by French and Indians anywhere, anytime. A lot of tribes were never so violent as they became when the European people came here. Never before, but they had to stand up for who they were or else be obliterated. French and Indian raiding parties terrorized settlers. The storm gathered faster. Murders were committed and many captives were exposed to meet death in its most frightful form. But as yet, we had not heard the death yell. Despite the looming threat of an Indian attack on his family, Thomas Jemison chose to stay on his land. It may very well be that Thomas Jemison thought that he could deal with the situation if it got worse. It did get worse. On an April morning in 1758, Mary returned from a neighbor's house. Our family was employed about their common business. Father was shaving an axe handle. Mother was making breakfast. Breakfast was not ready. The discharge of the guns. Mother almost fainted. Everyone trembled with fear. Engines. They secured my father. Rushed into the house. Made prisoners of mother, the three children, and myself. Then commenced plundering. They herded the captives into the woods and away from the new life they had begun. When our march, an Indian went behind us with a whip. He frequently lashed the children to make them keep up. We traveled till dark without a mouthful of food or a drop of water. Whenever the little children cried for water, the Indians would make them drink urine or go thirsty. They marched for two days before reaching a dark and dismal swamp. An Indian led Mary away. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of the righteousness. The following night, Mary sat by the fire and watched her captors dry scalps. 
one of them red-haired. The Indians took the scalps, wet and bloody, held them to the fire, and commenced scraping the flesh till they were dry and clean. They combed the hair in the neatest manner. My mother's hair was red. In western Pennsylvania, Mary was traded to two Seneca women. They adopted her as their sister, giving her the name Decoanus. It means two voices falling. Mary Jemison lived among the Seneca people for the rest of her life, witnessing the formation of a new country and the decline of the Indian people as their land was taken in the name of a young country's manifest destiny. In 1775, a large group of men packed into a crossroads tavern run by a Scotch-Irishman named Sam Geddes. The crowd was in a frenzy. The American Revolution was beginning. The men enlisted and marched to join George Washington's army near Boston. Too young to go with them was the tavern keeper's son, 16-year-old James. Six years later, in his father's tavern, James Geddes was made an officer in the militia. It marked the beginning of his long service to the community. The war put Sam Geddes in severe debt. His property was auctioned at a sheriff's sale. James bought a parcel of his father's land, including the Crossroads Tavern. In 1786, he began selling lots at $10 each. All those who have purchased lots are desired to call for their deeds, as they are now in readiness. James Geddes. He came at a time when the best good for the people of this land was to build towns and develop communities. He created centralization of populace which is what most people, most land planners are probably advocating today. Geddes Town was then part of Western York County and governed from the county seat some 40 miles east. Their experiences during the revolution with its emphasis upon liberty and self-government increasingly convinced the people in the Western part of York County that they were entitled to their own county government. It was a matter of either growing or dying, and to become a county seat would secure the future of the town. Hunter's Town and New Oxford vied with Geddes Town to be named the county seat. We transfer to the new county all ground rent and a lot for the jail on the condition that Geddes Town be fixed as the seat of justice. James Geddes. On January 22nd, 1800, a new county was formed, named for President John Adams, and Gettysburg was its seat of government. James Gettys was elected to the state legislature. Over time, he served as sheriff, treasurer, mayor, and bank director. By the end of his career, he was known to all as General James Gettys. Late in the winter of 1815, a fever spread through the Geddes family. James's mother, Isabella, died on a Sunday, James on a Monday, and his wife, Mary, on the following Friday. As a husband and a father, Mr. Geddes was peculiarly affectionate and indulgent. As a friend, he was sincere, and as a companion, polite, social, and cheerful. Adam Sentinel. Listed in James Geddes' will was a mulatto girl held in slavery named Sydney. I'm proud to go back to a woman because I'm a strong black woman. And I like the fact of starting, being able to start my line from a woman, from Sydney. Whites continued to own slaves in Adams County into the 19th century. Slowly, they were emancipated. 
The growing population of free blacks settled in the southwestern section of Gettysburg. And on a rise of ground in Quaker Valley, known as Yellow Hill. A year after James Geddes' death, a tall man with an awkward limp arrived in Gettysburg. Thaddeus Stevens had come to practice law. The work was scarce and he was about ready to leave when a farmhand killed a fellow worker. Stevens took the case, the first murder trial in the county and argued it so ably that the fact that his client was found guilty and hanged at the intersection of the Baltimore and Emmitsburg bikes did not slow the young lawyer's meteoric rise in the community. In the time he lived in Adams County, Stevens helped establish a library, published a newspaper, served as a bank director, and became one of the largest property owners in the area, including an iron forge he called Caledonia. Eventually, his influence would extend far beyond Adams County. Some deem it of much more importance that the mud holes in their roads should be filled up than that the rubbish of ignorance be cleared away from the intellects of their children. Stevens believed in public education because it liberates people's potential. Until you have the opportunity to get more education, you can't know what you can be. And he wanted all Americans, black and white, rich and poor, to have the opportunity to reach the limit of their potential. In 1833, Stevens was elected to the state legislature. In his first term, he secured funds for a new school in Gettysburg, known then as Pennsylvania College. The following year, citizens, upset by increased taxes, presented the legislature with 30,000 signatures urging the repeal of the free school law. Stevens addressed the legislature. It would seem to be humiliating to be under the necessity in the 19th century to prove the utility and to free governments the absolute necessity of education. You can have education without a real democracy, but you can't have a democracy without education. And uh, it's an indispensable uh, prerequisite for the development of, uh, of, democratic, of a democratic society. I trust that when we come to act on this question, we shall take lofty ground and so cast our votes that the blessings of education shall be carried home to the poorest child, of the poorest inhabitant, of the meanest hut of your mountains. Public schools were saved, and Stevens would be known forever as the father of free education. Education ought to be free as air to every human being. Around this time, a new book was published, and a copy found its way into the county. It was the story of a woman who had lived her life among the Indians. She had married twice, the second time to one of the fiercest Seneca warriors. She had had eight children and come to own nearly 18,000 acres of land in upstate New York. A narrative of the life of Mrs. Mary Jemison is still in print today. I feel as though I could lay down in peace a life that has been checked with troubles of a deeper dye than are commonly experienced by mortals. Mary Jemison died at the age of 90. Over the years, she declined numerous opportunities to return to the white world, preferring to stay with her children in the mother-centered society of the Seneca people. Having achieved victory in education, Thaddeus Stevens joined the growing movement to abolish slavery. Adams County occupied some uneasy middle ground during the 1840s and 1850s, precisely because it lay at the border between slavery and freedom. We have no slaves here, so why come down here to disturb our boroughs with discussions of slavery? Moses McLean, Esquire. So, then, human liberty is become merely a local question, is it? 
Wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait. An illegal network of safe houses called the Underground Railroad helped runaway slaves reach freedom. For many, Adams County was the first stop north of the Mason-Dixon line. Slaves would escape from their masters and their masters would come after them. Folks in Adams County sometimes sympathized with the masters, sometimes they sympathized with the slaves. A black woman named Mag Palm lived in Gettysburg. I was attacked by a group of men who made the attempt to take me south where they expected to sell me. I'm a powerful woman and they would have derived quite a profit. I was fighting them as best I could with my hands tied. I succeeded in catching a thumb in my mouth, bit that thumb off, and drove those kidnappers off. They wanted their freedom. It was as simple as that. They wanted their freedom. A free black man named Basil Biggs worked on a farm along Marsh Creek, where he hid fugitives. At night, he took them to the black community on Yellow Hill. From there, they were guided to meet other agents of the Underground Railroad. Among these were the Wrights, a Quaker family living above York Springs. It was very elaborate, very difficult, very trying, very dangerous, uh, for there were the bloodhounds and the slave catchers and everything on your heels all the time. One evening, the Wrights took in a panicked family of fugitives. As the slave catchers approached, the runaways were scattered into hiding places. But their baby cried. The slave catchers entered the house and began searching. One barged into the bedroom and found Mrs. Wright in bed with a baby wrapped in a blanket. Embarrassed, he apologized, and the slave catchers left. Afterwards, Mrs. Wright said simply, I am glad they did not see the baby. It is claimed that 1,000 runaway slaves passed through the Wright House to freedom. Most of the people who tried to escape slavery didn't make it. Most were taken back. We trailed him about a mile, treed him, made the dogs pull him out of the tree, bit him badly. I think he will stay home for a while. David Barrow, slave owner. The only place they can find equality is in the grave. There, all God's children are equal. Thaddeus Stevens. In 1858, the last slave owned in Adams County, a 93-year-old woman known as Old Tacy Hack, died. Her given name had been Patience. In 1860, a 17-year-old Gettysburg school teacher began keeping a diary with the words, let love and truth indict whatever here I write. And indeed, Sally Myers would write, keeping a diary until she died in 1922. November 6, 1860. Hurrah for Lincoln. Everyone is rejoicing over the great triumph the Republican Party has achieved. The election of Abraham Lincoln led to the formation of the Confederacy and the beginning of the Civil War. The young men of Adams County went to war. Among those who joined Company K of the Pennsylvania Reserves were Sally Myers' brother Jefferson Myers, George Kitzmiller, the great-grandson of the man who killed Dudley Diggs, and a teacher, educated at Pennsylvania College, named Henry Minig. We rendezvoused at Gettysburg and entered an experience which few suspected would last. Private Henry Minig. I put my knapsack on my back, rifle on my shoulder, headed down to Gettysburg Town, and they made me a soldier. We moved northwest of Washington City, and now followed many weary days consisting of drill. The boys were eager to whip the Johnnies and then go home. Orderly Sergeant Henry Minnig. J. 
June 15. The town is all in an uproar. Merchants are packing their goods and sending them off, and everyone shares in the confusion caused by the news. The rebels are coming. In June of 1863, Robert E. Lee marched his Confederate army across the Mason-Dixon line and into Adams County. June 21. Blacks are skedaddling. Their fear of the rebels is caused by the belief that they will be captured and sold as slaves. Oh dear, I wish the excitement was over. Not only the slave runaway, but any black person uh, was, uh, was, was liable to be swept up and taken back. And Many blacks, including Basil Biggs, fled, some to the secluded Yellow Hill settlement. Though now a congressman from Lancaster, Thaddeus Stevens was tending his ironworks at Caledonia. As rebels approached, he rushed away. The invaders, offended by Stevens' anti-slavery beliefs, burned the operation to the ground. June 26, in rebeldom. The long looked for rebels made their appearance with their old red flag flying and yelling like fiends. We had seen enough of the ravages of warfare in the Southland to cause us to be anxious for the welfare of our loved ones. First Lieutenant Henry Minnick. June 29. Rebel campfires can be seen in the mountains. We expect a battle both near and soon. May God help us. For surely our cause is one of justice and humanity. On the morning of July 1st, the greatest battle of the American Civil War began in a farmer's field outside Gettysburg. At 10 o'clock, a horse was led past our house covered with blood. The sight sickened me. I've never been able to stand the sight of blood. Fighting would rage for three days. Citizens hid themselves however they could. On the second day, Company K arrived in their homeland. Some of the company began to recognize well-known faces. One said, Fie, John, for what the devil did you let them rebel soldiers come up here, eh? John's reply was, Why, Uncle Sam, it was all planned out so that I could get home and see my mammy. First Lieutenant Henry Minnie. Casualties swelled in some of the most brutal fighting of the war. Nearly every horse, boy, structure becomes a hospital. I went into the church. The men were scattered all over it, some lying in pews and some on the bare floor. The suffering and groans of the wounded and dying were terrible to see and hear. I knelt by one and said, what can I do for you? He looked at me with mournful, fearless eyes and said, Nothing. I am going to die. I went out, sat down on the church step, and cried. The dying man was Sergeant Alexander Stewart. Sally Myers brought him back to her house to care for him. A Union position on a hill south of Gettysburg came under heavy attack. It dominates everything. If the Confederates had captured Little Round Top, they could have put their guns there and fired in for the fair, which is right down the entire Union line. We were hurried at a double quick to the extreme left at the Round Tops. At the word of command, we swept down the face of the hill, meeting rebels as they came rushing forward. Down the slopes of Little Round Top, down into through the valley and then off to the peach orchard. The Union held Little Round Top. If it hadn't been for the Union's winning the Little Round Top, we'd be going to Richmond instead of Washington. That night we were ordered to the cellar. Stuart insisted on my going, but I could not leave him. 
a mini ball came through two walls and struck the floor where I had been sitting but a few minutes before. I would have been struck through the neck. July 3rd dawned with more intense fighting. Believing that one massive final attack would defeat the Union Army and possibly win the war, General Lee pointed to a copse of trees and ordered 13,000 Confederate soldiers to charge the Union Center. It was a slaughter. Pickett's charge was repulsed. The battle ended. The Union was born in Philadelphia, 1776, but preserved in Gettysburg in 1863. That night, Henry Minnick braved enemy pickets to visit his home. I entered into the main building and found no one. I turned to the cellar and saw a father and mother, four sisters and a brother, each a perfect image of dejection. I revealed the state of affairs and brought them from the lower world into the light and comfort of the upper world. That night, the Confederate Army began the evacuation of Gettysburg. The rebels have left and we are again in possession of the town. I have never spent a happier fourth. On the 4th of July, 1863, it rained. The Confederate Army retreated, the Union Army regrouped, and Adams Countyans began to come to terms with what had happened on their land. Dead and dying men outnumbered the citizens of Gettysburg 10 to 1. Sally Myers continued her care of Alexander Stewart. It is hard to imagine what she must have felt to have taken this soldier from the very first encounter. She had to have taken him into her heart. She took, she took care of him. She wrote his family. She must have felt toward him as one would feel toward a brother. July 6. He has been sinking gradually all morning. I held him in my arms until nearly 11 when his head sank on the pillow and he died with only a slight struggle. I have never been so much interested in a stranger. Sally Myers continued tending wounded soldiers. In late July, she received a letter from Sergeant Alexander Stewart's younger brother, Henry. It marked the beginning of a close relationship. The burning of his ironworks cost Thaddeus Stevens over $75,000. We must all expect to suffer by this wicked war. If, finally, the government shall be reestablished over our whole territory and not a vestige of slavery left, I shall deem it a cheap purchase. Thaddeus Stevens. Over time, the destruction would be replaced by a new economy centered upon the memory of the battle. In the midst of the nation's greatest crisis, the northern states chose to honor their dead by creating a national cemetery. One of the men hired to haul bodies was Basil Biggs. Basil Biggs has an awful job. He's digging up decaying bodies. He's carting them to a cemetery. But there, Lincoln would speak about a new birth of freedom. The road ahead would be long. But in our time, African Americans would become the heads of universities, corporations, and are beginning to take their rightful place in society. In November, the dedication of the new cemetery brought 15,000 spectators to Gettysburg. The long looked for 19th is here at last. I went up the street and saw the procession going out to the cemetery and then came home to work saw the president and a great many distinguished men, but had little time to look at them. Sally Myers. On the treeless hill south of town, Abraham Lincoln spoke for barely two minutes. 
Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. In a very few words, he sums up the, the whole cause for which the nation has been fighting for. It turned a war for the Union into a war for freedom. It's, 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 a, it's a masterful statement. She'll have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Less than a year later, most Adams Countyans would vote against Abraham Lincoln in the presidential election. Abraham Lincoln was reelected. In June of that election year, Company K was mustered out of service. Three years before, we had gone forth fully strong, and now we were merely a handful. Then full of life and buoyancy, now war-worn and battle-scarred veterans. Brevet Major Henry Minnick. In the same month, Sally Myers received a visit from Henry Stewart. June 1864. Mr. Stewart and I had a delightful walk in conversation. Yet, I fear it is the forerunner of trouble. It seems as though the happiness is almost too great. A year later, in the spring of 1865, the Civil War ended. Like the rest of the country, Adams Countyans moved on. Henry Minnick became a minister and published a history of Company K. Thaddeus Stevens died in 1868. He was buried beside blacks in a non-segregated cemetery in Lancaster. Sally Myers married Henry Stewart, but her husband continued to suffer from a war wound. His condition was so bad that he was essentially bedridden. And so there she was with a husband who was critically ill. The baby was growing about to be born the following fall, and I'm sure her situation was desperate. October 17, 1868. One year ago today, I left home a happy bride. This morning, the cold snow is falling thick and fast upon my precious husband's grave. Sally Myers Stewart. 10 days later, Sally Myers Stewart gave birth to a boy she named Henry Alexander for a father he would never know, and an uncle killed at Gettysburg. Oh, hard times come again no more. With the money he earned burying Union dead, Basil Biggs bought his own farm. He began clearing the land and was about to cut down a thicket when it was explained to him that they were the very same trees Robert E. Lee had pointed to when he ordered Pickett's charge. Biggs let the trees stand. In the years that followed, the battlefield became the center of a thriving tourist industry. <laughs> Sally Myers Stewart supported herself and her son by teaching in a school for black children. Her support for integration of the black and white schools made her unpopular with many in the county. She saw that there's something wrong with two different educational systems in the town that had the Civil War with the Gettysburg Address, all men are created equal. It has made me so much trouble that I feel it is best for them and me not to teach the school again. So I have laid down the burden. Blacks faced other problems. For reasons unknown, the Yellow Hill community disappeared. Why these people left has never been explained. In 1878, neighbors living north of Cashtown were puzzled by a strange sight a farmer named Noah Sheely had planted 2,000 apple trees. It was by far the largest orchard in the county.
It was said of Noah Sheely that there is a right way, a wrong way, and Noah's way. Many looked upon his orchard as an absurd venture. Small orchards had been a staple on farms since the first settlers, but by the last decades of the 19th century, a glut in the fruit market depressed prices. Worthless apples were left to rot. I don't know what I'm going to do with my apples when harvested. Noah Sheely. As the dawn of a new century approached, America was changing. More immigrants are coming into this country. More Americans are moving into cities. And there is a demand for fruit. The primary fruit is the apple. The sunny slopes and rich soil of the South Mountain foothills, combined with a mild climate, made Adams County ideal for apple growing. It's a gravel-type soil, well-suited for, for apples and peaches. It's a kind of unique soil, rare to have a, a large amount of that in, in one particular area. <laughs> In 1884, a railroad was built in the northern part of the county. Now there was an efficient way to ship apples out of the county. It was time for Noah Sheely to sell his crop. Fittingly, he would find his buyer in no ordinary way. What happened was, Grandfather Noah went out to Chicago to this World's Fair and got to blowing off about what wonderful apples were here in Pennsylvania. And this J.H. Bunker company took him up and said, I'm coming in to see, and grandfather says, well, come on. John Sheely Lim. I have this day bought of Noah Sheely all of his apples, two inches and over in diameter and free of wormholes in the sides. J.H. Bunker Company, Chicago, Illinois. Noah Sheely had made the first large commercial sale of Adams County apples. As word of his success spread around the county, other farmers began planting large orchards. Mr. Sheely well deserves his name as the Apple King of Adams County, not only for his personal success, but also for the interest he has taken in bringing Adams County into prominence as a fruit-growing county. Gettysburg News. In 1880, Adams County had ranked 47th in apple production among Pennsylvania counties. By 1920, it ranked first. In the fall of 1914, neighbors were again struck by a curious sight on the Sheely farm. The preceding year, the barn had burned. The Sheely brothers, following in their father's innovative footsteps, decided to replace the burnt barn with a structure like no other in the county. The barn is a symbol of innovation, symbolic of the cyclical nature of agriculture in this part of Adams County. Harrisburg Patriot News. The round barn still stands, a testament to Noah Sheely's enterprising spirit and his 2,000 apple trees. Today, there are over one million apple trees in Adams County. In 1915, Henry Minnick died at the age of 77. That same year, another soldier saw Gettysburg for the first time, touring the battlefield with his West Point class. The young cadet would return sooner than he expected. My chief said, he was impressed with my organizational ability. I was directed to take troops who would not be going overseas and proceed to an old abandoned campsite in, of all places, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. My mood was black. Dwight Eisenhower. I didn't want to be in Gettysburg in 1918. He wanted to be fighting in Europe with the officers he trained with at West Point. But he took the assignment, as he took all assignments, with good grace and he did his best with it. Eisenhower lived in Gettysburg with his young wife, Mamie. In October, he received orders to depart for Europe. A week before he was to leave, 
the war ended. November 11, 1918. The town is wild over the news. It is over. A wonderful, fantastic parade. Thank God. Sally Meyer Stewart. I suppose I'll spend the rest of my life explaining why I didn't get into this war. By God, from now on, I'm cutting myself a swath that will make up for this. The swath cut by Dwight Eisenhower would reach Europe, the White House, and ultimately return to Adams County. July 31, 1920. Registered for voting. She was able to actually cast a vote after spending her entire life serving other people, working hard, being independent, earning her own paycheck, raising her own family. And yet, it was not until she was 76 years old that she was even able to vote for the leaders who made the decisions that governed her. Two years later, she wrote in her diary for the final time. January 12, 1922. Usual work and a little washing, but spent most of the day writing. The following Saturday, Sally Myers Stewart died. On a battlefield where thousands had died, there was a gathering. What happened in the 20s still goes on. It's just we don't wear white sheets, we don't wear hoods anymore. It's not uncommon for black people to be called niggers. In 1938, on the same field, marking the battle's 75th anniversary, Civil War veterans, North and South, met for a final reunion. Their average age was 94. President Franklin Roosevelt dedicated a memorial to peace eternal in a nation united. I accept this monument in the spirit of brotherhood and peace. Three years later, Roosevelt sent Americans into the greatest war the world has ever seen. The man he chose as Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces was General Dwight David Eisenhower. He led the Allies to victory and returned from Europe a world hero. General of the Army, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Western Allies, received the greatest... Mamie and I began to think about buying a house and a farm to which we could retire. For my part, I wanted an escape from concrete into the countryside. Ike and Mamie fell in love with a run-down farm on the edge of the battlefield. In 1951, they purchased the property. When I die, I'm going to leave a piece of ground better than I found it. A year later, Eisenhower was elected president. He used the farm as a weekend retreat. It was a place he took world leaders to work one-on-one -on -one with them. He was always convinced, if I can get a man alone, look him in the eye and be in a relaxed circumstance with him, I can do business with that man. In the summer of 1956, Eisenhower examined photographs of his farm taken by a U-2 spy plane. A month later, U-2s began flying secret missions over the Soviet Union. Eisenhower still searched for a path toward peace and away from nuclear war. In September of 1959, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev came to the United States. A full dress welcome is mustered for the Red Premier with President Eisenhower on hand for the ceremonies of... Meetings between the leaders were going nowhere. Eisenhower wanted time alone with his Soviet counterpart. They headed to the farm. So they came down from Camp David in a helicopter and landed on the lawn there at the Gettysburg farm. And uh, Khrushchev was brought out onto the sun porch, and he sat in one of the, the white chairs there. And Eisenhower introduced his grandchildren, three girls and a boy, uh, to Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev was quite smitten with the four Eisenhower grandchildren, immediately began making conversation through an interpreter with them. Khrushchev made a huge fuss over me individually because he was saying that there was 
really not the um, name equivalent of uh, Susan in Russian, but Susanna, and he made a fuss, and I felt very special. And then the next part of the conversation I remember very well was Khrushchev's invitation to us to come to Moscow. The Eisenhowers accepted the invitation. It seemed that the Cold War was thawing. In Moscow, Nikita Khrushchev is shown as he told the Soviet Presidium that pilot Gary Powers of the downed American reconnaissance plane was alive. But a month before the scheduled visit, the U-2 was shot down over the Soviet Union. Khrushchev was enraged. The Eisenhower's trip was canceled. And the Cold War continued for the next 30 years. So help me God. So help me God. After President Kennedy repeated the traditional, so help me God, Mamie and I made our way toward an exit. We were free. We left the capital and followed the route, now grown familiar to us, through the suburbs, through the countryside, and so came to the farm where we expected to spend the remainder of our lives. The Eisenhowers would spend the rest of their lives living on the farm, always aware of those who had worked the land before. The ground on which my house stands is a tie that binds me to their memory. I feel a kinship with them that is very real and has excited my curiosity to learn more about them. Eisenhower died in 1969 at the age of 79. Mamie lived on the farm until her death 10 years later. History is far more than the excitement of battle. In a place like Gettysburg, the visitor, the native for that matter, may easily become absorbed in the three days conflict, forgetting that history was also made here in quiet lives on farm and village street. In 1960, two months before Dwight Eisenhower retired to Gettysburg, a young farmer arrived with his wife, two children, and 24 dairy cows to begin a new life. They had left the family farm in eastern Pennsylvania. We couldn't continue farming in Montgomery County. Housing started in that area, and land prices started to go up, and we knew that there was no future there in Montgomery County. So uh, we decided to look elsewhere. They bought a farm in Adams County, far removed from suburban development. They named it Lagging Stream, and there they began rearing a family. If I were a brain of Einstein, I would never give up what I'm doing. Now, I want to do things right, but I enjoyed being on the farm and being actually out there planting and harvesting and part of that farm, that's what I am. I do look at it as, as a steward of, of the land and that, that, that I have an obligation to, to pass this farm on to the next generation uh, to, to and try to improve on it, make it better than what it was when we, we first took over. As Tom Clowney's family grew, so did Adams County. Some of the development necessary to support all the new people began to take on the character of suburban sprawl. Taxes went up. Some farmers began selling their land to developers. I'm worried about the direction we're going in. We are changing so rapidly, and I'm worried that if we don't learn how to control this change, it's going to, to change us. By the year 2000, Adams County seemed poised to follow the course of Montgomery and other eastern Pennsylvania counties from which Tom Clowney had fled only a few decades earlier. Uh, the housing industry and shopping malls just took over uh, and uh, from the very land that we farmed and owned, there's not one acre of ground left that's available to farm. And it gets a little depressing when we go back to visit our relatives and you you have memories, but that's all you have. You can't see the open farm team where they're completely gone. I don't want to see it happen here. Um, I've lived through it. I've seen it happen all over the country. It doesn't have to happen to Adams County. The county needs to get together and step back 
for a year or two and actually stop for a second to take a look at what is up and coming. If you try to do it while the train is rolling, the brakeman can't stop the train. The tools exist to stop sprawl. We've got to look at better land use planning and zoning. We've got to use our land preservation program. Uh, we've got to try and protect our open land and valuable farms. In 1990, Tom Clowney became the first president of the Adams County Farmland Preservation Board. A year later, his farm was one of the first pieces of ground protected by this new organization. Over the next decade, 10,000 acres of Adams County farmland were preserved. Still, much of the county remains vulnerable to sprawling development. We're going to keep seeing growth uh, in the county, which I don't think nobody wants to stop that completely. We also have got to, uh, to have the attitude that we, we can't develop every inch of ground. It's a magical, it's a magical county. It's one of the most beautiful places in the United States. Every day, a little bit of the earth is covered up, whether it's a sidewalk or a parking lot, foundation for a home. Every single day, a little piece of the earth is covered up. And what does that, what's that gonna lead to? Do we have an unlimited supply of land in which we wanna see cookie cuttered up so we look like the Virginia countryside outside of Washington? And I think the answer is no. You want it to stay beautiful for your children. You want it to stay beautiful for your grandchildren. I think it's important. I think it's a gift that I can give to my children so that someday they can at least say, Mom tried. In his 40 years in Adams County, Tom Clowney's farm and family have prospered. Four of his five children continue to work the land. Someday his grandchildren may as well. It, it, it just gives you a terrific feeling uh, to see the crops growing, but the contours of the, of the, of the gr grain of the corn and the, and the alfalfa fields blending together, and that, that's a lot of satisfaction too. And, and so, you know, I'm hoping we can stay here for the rest of our lives. This is our home. Was that good enough? If anyone has any questions for Jake, 